Good evening aspirants welcome to the hindi news analysis brought to you by shankar ais academy for the date 13th of april 2022 and these are the articles i have taken for discussion today we are going to discuss wide range of topics that are relevant in the prelims perspective as well as from the mains especially this editorial article is important in the mains perspective and in the remaining topics we'll be seeing some prelims related areas pay attention to all these discussions because at the end i also have quiz questions for you so that you can assess your level of understanding okay now let us get to the first discussion now let us take up this news article it mentions that the three cities of the world 2021 has been announced see this is a recognition or a tag that is given to the cities and the news is that two cities from india have got this tag so first let us know what is this three cities of the world then we'll see the news article See this three cities of the world program focuses on urban forests. As you know, urban forests help to define a sense of place and well-being where people live, work, play and learn. So in this way, this program is an international effort to recognize cities and towns that are committed to ensuring that their urban forests as well as the trees are properly maintained, they are sustainably managed and they are duly celebrated. So who manages this program it is managed by the FAO Food and Agricultural Organization of the UN along with the Arbor Day Foundation of the USA Now who can apply to get this recognition See the municipalities of any size around the world can apply to earn this designation tree city of the world See apart from maintaining the urban forests there is another main goal of this program which is to connect the cities around the world in a new network Here the cities will be committed to share and adopt the most successful approaches to manage community trees and forests and to be recognized as a tree city a community or a municipality must meet five core standards these core standards illustrate a commitment to caring for its trees and forest here are the five standards you can just go through it they are establishing responsibility setting the rules knowing what they have and then allocating resources and also celebrating the achievements now what are the benefits of this recognition actually the three cities of the world provides direction assistance and worldwide recognition for a community's dedication to its urban forest so in this manner the program provides a framework for a healthy sustainable urban forestry program in our own town or city but the program by itself does not provide any rewards on the other hand the reward is through the recognition and the end result that is attained to obtain this recognition has substantial benefits see some of the major benefits are it will lead to more tree cover in the cities so this in way will reduce the cost for energy storm water management and it will provide erosion control then it will also boost the property values across the communities it will also help in building stronger ties to our neighborhood and the city and finally if this recognition gains publicity then it will boost the tourism and its allied sectors in that particular city so this in a way will generate more revenues and that is why this program is important so now what is the news today the news is that two cities from india has gained this recognition in the three cities of the world 2021 and these cities are the city of hyderabad and mumbai This is particularly special for Hyderabad because it already found a place on this list last year also. So this is the second time Hyderabad is declared as the tree city of the world. As per the data released by the foundation, in Hyderabad there are 3.5 crore trees which were planted with 500 volunteer hours over 2 years. And Mumbai also finds pride of place in the listing with uh, having 425,000 trees that were planted with 25,000 volunteer hours. So these were the achievements by Hyderabad and Mumbai that gained them the tag of tree city of the world. So these are the few facts that you need to know about this news article and the tree cities program. Now let us get to the next discussion. Now let us take up this editorial article. What is it about? It is about the universal health care. In this editorial, the author of this editorial argues that universal health care has become a well accepted objective of public policy around the world. It is because it has been realized not only in the rich countries but even the growing countries like Brazil, China, Sri Lanka and Thailand they are adopting universal health care. But still in India it is not yet widely popularized. So author is suggesting that it is time for India to be on board with the idea of universal health care or UHC. 
author is mainly suggesting this based on the fact that even when thailand made this decision to move towards universal health care it had the same per capita gdp of what india now has today and thailand did this 20 years ago so in this manner according to the author it is right time for india to go for universal health care and that is why today we are going to see what is universal health care then we'll see the different routes to achieve universal health care as suggested by the author we'll also see some of the challenges associated with it and finally author is suggesting a new method called as hops we'll see what it is later in the discussion but before that the syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here so that you can know how relevant this topic is for prelims as well as mains See in mains in 2015 gs paper 2 we already had a question based on universal health coverage here you can see the question focuses on the involvement of private sector in providing universal health coverage so universal health coverage or universal health care is a topic that is always relevant from the upsc perspective so pay attention to this discussion let us start with the understanding of what is universal health care so according to who universal health coverage or universal health care means that all the people should have access to the health services they need when and where they need them without financial hardship and this is the term that you have to focus it is without financial hardship so universal health care includes the full range of essential health services from health promotion to disease prevention treatment rehabilitation and palliative care what is palliative care it is the treatment for complex illness So simply we can say universal health care means no one should be deprived of quality health care for the lack of ability to pay. Actually this idea is well expressed by the founder of National Health Service in Britain that is NHS the founder was Anirin Bevan he said that no society can legitimately call itself civilized if a sick person is denied medical aid because of lack of means. So you can quote this when you are writing a mains answer writing and when you are supporting universal health care but you may have a doubt that whether in india this idea has been proposed by any committee yes it is it was already proposed by the bhor committee report of 1946 here a case was made for india to create its own nhs type health care system nhs is national health service which is existing in britain see so this nhs is the best example of universal health care Now this board committee is also known as the Health Survey and Development Committee. It was appointed in 1946 under Sir Joseph Bohr. Now the report of this committee laid emphasis on the integration of curative medicine and preventive medicine at all levels. And the report also made comprehensive recommendations for remodeling of health services in India. So we saw what is UHC then we also saw that already Britain has UHC in the form of national health service we saw the quotation by Anirin Bevan and then we saw that Bohr committee in India has suggested to go for a NHS like health policy so now according to the author universal health coverage or care could be achieved through different routes one of the routes is public service and the other route is social insurance let us see the first route of public service So what do you think it means? See it exactly means what you think. It means healthcare is provided as a free public service just like the services of a fire service or public library. So here the outcome is universal healthcare that is everyone would be provided with quality healthcare. Now note that this approach is a socialist project but it even worked well in communist countries and even in the capitalist countries also according to the author. So the first approach of public service is nothing but providing free public health care. Now the next approach is the social insurance approach. Now in this approach it allows for private provision along with public provision of health care. But here the costs are mostly borne by the social insurance funds. This means health care will be provided in both government hospitals and private hospitals but the cost or the bill will be taken care by the social insurance funds therefore it will not be borne by the patient so this approach will also have the same outcome which is everyone will have access to quality health care but why author is suggesting for social insurance funds why not private insurance we all know about star health insurance bajaj health insurance etc why not them so it is because social insurance is very different from a private insurance market one of the main differences or the major difference is that social insurance is compulsory and it is universal 
so it is financed mainly from general taxation and it is run by a single non profit agency in the public interest so note the term in the public interest but what about private insurance here the case is totally different because it runs with profit as its base so social insurance is focused on public interest whereas private insurance will be focused on profit generation that is why social insurance only will ensure universal health care already we have certain social insurances like social security crop insurances for farmers etc so that is why author is also suggesting social insurance now in this social insurance approach will be having a single payer system which makes it easier for the state to bargain for good price from healthcare providers other than that there are also other models of social insurance like there is a model in germany here the social insurance is based on multiple non profit insurance funds instead of a single payer but even then at the end of the day the basic principles remain the same which is everyone should be covered and insurance should be for the public interest rather than for private profit so that means now india can use any one of these as it deems fit so these are the two approaches suggested by the author to achieve universal health care so now let us see the challenges in this universal health care see one of the main challenges associated with it is there is a risk of patients rushing to expensive hospitals why this will happen it is mainly because of the fact that there are not enough public health centers so this proves that even in a system based on social insurance public service still plays an essential role see if the patients are going to take expensive care just because there is absence of public health centers then it would make the system wasteful and expensive right and that is why a solution for this problem could be opening more public health centers as you know currently indian government has primary health care centers under its national health mission so more centers could be opened now the second challenge is containing the cost this is because both patient and healthcare provider have a joint interest in the expensive care that is here the patient wants to get better on the other hand the healthcare provider wants to earn money according to the author actually there is a solution to this problem it is requiring the patient to bear one part of the costs this is called as co-payment but in the beginning i said that universal healthcare means without financial hardship so that means this measure directly comes in conflict with the principle of universal health care and according to the author there are also evidences which suggest that even small co-payments often exclude many poor patients from quality health care so that is why some other measures could also be taken up here and the third important challenge pointed out by author is the regulation of private health care providers so here the need is for distinction between for profit providers and non profit providers here the non profit uh, private healthcare providers have done great work around the world but on the other hand the for profit healthcare providers there is always a conflict between the profit motive and the well being of the patient and that is why there is a need for strict regulation so these are the three important challenges pointed out by the author in the universal healthcare now listening to all these what do you think is the best route for india we can say that the nhs model based on plain public service approach seems to be the best option especially for india here you should remember that most countries that have universal health care rely on a combination of public service and social insurance but a vibrant national health service encapsulating the universal health care is hard to beat but here again the problem will be in the private sector only because they won't like the nhs model purely based on public service because it will lower the profit ultimately but here the suggestion is it is still possible to have a framework for universal health care that would be built primarily on health care as a public service and in the due course coverage could be achieved towards full nhs model and here is where author is suggesting hops that i said in the beginning here hops stands for healthcare as an optional public service so what is this so it is the idea that everyone would have a legal right to receive free quality healthcare in the public institution only if they wish so it would not prevent anyone from seeking healthcare from private sector at their own expense but at the same time the public sector would also guarantee decent health services to everyone as a matter of right and also free of cost so here we can understand that hops will not be as egalitarian as the nhs or the national health insurance model where most people are in the same healthcare boat but this hops 
could be a step towards achieving the universal health care further it will also become more egalitarian over time this will mainly happen when the public sector provides a growing range of health services so if quality health care is available for free in the public sector most patients will have little reason to go to the private sector right now here even the social insurance can play a role it can help cover procedures that are not easily available in the public sector like you know high end surgeries for these social insurance can be provided but here the risk will be you know tilting health care towards expensive tertiary care and there is also risk of uh, health care towards the better off sections that is the rich sections of the population but you have to remember that every measure has its own advantages and disadvantages and the main difficulty with the hops framework will be to specify the scope of the proposed health care guarantee including the quality standards in the hops here universal health care will not mean unlimited health care there are always limits to what can be guaranteed to everyone so in order to address this hops need health care standards and according to the author some useful elements are already available such as the indian public health standards so based on this hops framework can be drafted now as a final conclusion author is suggesting one of the states that can take up hops in its health care policy it is the state of tamil nadu See, currently, Tamil Nadu is drafting Right to Health Bill. And Tamil Nadu is also already able to provide most health services in the public sector with good effect. Actually, this fact is supplemented by the findings of 4th National Family Health Survey. According to the survey, a large majority of households in Tamil Nadu go to the public sector for health care when they are sick. So, author is suggesting that the Right to Health Bill that is being drafted by the Tamil Nadu government can incorporate hops and it should act as a model and inspiration for all other states. So, that is all about the universal health care and the hops framework. In this discussion, we saw what is universal health care first. It is providing quality health care without financial hardship. It includes health promotion, disease prevention, disease treatment, rehabilitation and palliative care. Already Britain has the National Health Service. It is an example of universal health care. And in India, it was suggested by Bohr Committee Report of 1946. An author has suggested two routes for achieving uh, UHC. One is the public service route and the other one is social insurance route. Public service means free public health care. And uh, social insurance means the bill will be taken care by the social insurance funds. Then we saw about the three main challenges associated with UHC. The first main challenge is people rushing to expensive hospitals. This could be averted by increasing the number of public health centers. Then the second challenge is containing the cost. Here the co-payment system could be instituted as a solution. Then the third challenge is regulation of private health care providers. so that the well being of patient is kept above the profit motive and finally we saw that india should go for a national health service model based on plain public service and while working towards that india could opt for hops which is healthcare as an optional public service so what is hops here everyone will have the legal right to receive free quality healthcare in a public institution only if they wish so they can get healthcare services from private sector at their own expense as well as from the public sector at free of cost finally the conclusion was the tamil nadu's right to health bill could incorporate this framework so that every other state can learn from it so these are the points that you have to take note from this editorial discussion now let us move on to the next discussion so now let us take up this next news article it is about the 2 plus 2 ministerial dialogue between india and usa See in this dialogue broad range of issues were discussed so today we are going to see the important outcomes of this dialogue it will be useful for your prelims plus you can use these points in your mains answer writing when you talk about india us relationship if you remember the first or the inaugural 2 plus 2 dialogue took place in 2018 in new delhi and now is the fourth edition of this 2 plus 2 dialogue between usa and india It took place in Washington DC 2 days ago and this ministerial dialogue is between the ministers of defense and external affairs of both the countries now let us come to the outcomes of this recent dialogue see here the ministers reviewed broad range of issues in different sectors and different areas for example from the global partnership perspective the ministers reviewed mutual efforts to respond to the worsening humanitarian crisis in ukraine and they also assessed its broader implications they also urged an immediate cessation of hostilities and they also condemned civilian deaths in addition to this quad leader summit in tokyo in 2022 was also discussed 
Here, the ministers reaffirmed their commitment to a free and open Indo-Pacific, in which the sovereignty and territorial integrity of all the states will be respected and the countries will be free from military, economic and political coercion. Along with all these, UNSC was also discussed. So here, USA affirmed its continued support for India's permanent membership at the formed United Nations Security Council. And it also supported India's entry to the nuclear suppliers group. Now, under the economic cooperation, the ministers noted the substantial progress in negotiations for an investment incentive agreement, that is IIA. These agreements will be between the governments of India and USA. And this agreement provides a framework to continue to expand USA's investment in India. It will lead to private sector-led projects in critical areas such as renewable energy, agriculture, healthcare, etc. And then in defense cooperation also, many issues were discussed. Here, the ministers reaffirmed the ambitions for building an advanced and comprehensive defense partnership in which the USA and the Indian militaries coordinate closely together across all domains. The ministers also underscored the importance of cooperation in space and they welcomed plans to conduct an inaugural defense space dialogue in the year 2022. They also discussed opportunities to further advance and deepen maritime cooperation. But most importantly, under the defense cooperation, USA welcomed India's decision to join the Combined Maritime Forces Task Force. See here, India will be joining as an associate partner to expand the multilateral cooperation in the Indian Ocean. So let us briefly see what is this Combined Maritime Forces. So it is a multinational maritime or naval partnership. It exists to uphold the rules-based international order. It was originally established in 2002. This Combined Maritime Force or CMF counters illicit non-state actors on high seas. Thereby, it promotes security, stability and prosperity across approximately 3.2 million square miles of international waters. So, this is a region that encompasses some of the world's most important shipping lanes. So, in this manner, CMF also focuses on counter-narcotics cooperation, counter-smuggling cooperation, suppressing piracy, etc. And it also responds to environmental incidents and humanitarian incidents when requested. So, through all this, CMF enables a free flow of commerce, it improves maritime security, and it also deters illicit activity by non-state actors in the CMF area of operations. And note that its headquarters is in Bahrain. And as of now, it has three combined task forces. One is focused on counter piracy and one is based on operations outside the Arabian Gulf and the other one is operations inside the Arabian Gulf. Totally, CMF has 34 member nations. Actually, it was 33 only, but last year in 2021, Egypt joined as the 34th member. But still, it is a force, right? So it should be commanded by someone. The CMF is commanded by the U.S. Navy Vice Admiral and its deputy commander is a United Kingdom Royal Navy Commodore. So we can say that CMF is under the control of U.S. and U.K. And now India will be joining as an associate partner to the Combined Maritime Forces Task Force. In addition to all these, other important matters were also discussed in the areas of counterterrorism, global health, science, technology, cybersecurity, space, environment, clean energy. We'll be seeing all these in the coming days in our editorial discussions. So with these points in mind, now let us get to the next discussion. So now we are going to take up this news article. Let us see what it says. It mentions that yesterday the Union Cooperation Minister has suggested that the elections to the cooperatives should be held in a democratic and transparent manner. He also urged that a body should be formed uh, similar to the Election Commission of India to oversee the elections of cooperatives. In addition to this, he noted that the European government is preparing model bylaws to govern around 63,000 primary agricultural credit societies across the country. Now, we know that cooperatives is a big subject and that is why today we are going to concentrate on the PACS, that is Primary Agricultural Credit Societies. But why suddenly I'm going to discuss about it? Because already there is a question based on a rural cooperative system. Yes, we had a question on 2020 that was related to DCCBs, District Central Cooperative Banks. As you can see here, majorly it focused on the DCCBs. And there was also a question linking it to PACS, Primary Agricultural Credit Societies. I'll be discussing this question at the end in the practice prelims question session. But now we are going to concentrate on PACS only. Now, to understand about PACS, you should know what is a cooperative bank. 
the cooperative banks are the financial entities which are established on a cooperative basis and they belong to the members this means the customers of the cooperative bank are also its owners now these banks provide a wide range of regular banking and financial services and if you should note that there was also a cooperative movement in india that was started primarily for dealing with the problem of rural credit therefore to assess the rural india it established a three tier rural cooperative structure in the first tier we have the state cooperative banks which function at the state level then we have uh, central cooperative banks at the district level this is the tier 2 and that is where they are also called as district central cooperative banks and at the third level we have the pacs so what are these they are the short term agricultural credit institutions they cater to the short term financial needs of agriculturalists now particularly if you concentrate on pacs this society forms base in the three tier cooperative credit structure and it is a village level institution so it directly deals with the rural people as i already said they work on the basis of cooperative principles now what they do is they provide short term loan to rural people to meet their financial requirements apart from this they also encourage savings among the agriculturalists they also accept deposits from them and they also give loans to the needy borrowers and they collect the repayments so in this manner these pacs serve as the last link between the ultimate borrowers that is the rural people and the other higher agencies such as uh, central cooperative bank that is dccb then state cooperative banks and the rbi so how this pacs is formed so it may be started with 10 or more persons of a village and the membership fee in the society is nominal so that even the poorest agriculturalist can become a member of pacs but you note that these members of the society have ultimate liability that is each member undertakes full responsibility of the entire loss of the society in case there is a failure now also note that the management of the society is under the control of an elected body but what about its regulation does it come under rbi actually no pcs is outside the purview of banking regulation act of 1949 therefore they are not regulated by reserve bank of india remember this fact it is very important so these are few facts you have to know about pcs with these points in mind let us get to the next discussion now our next discussion is based on this news article from hyderabad edition it reports about an incident in which the governor of telangana visited the houses of konda reddy tribe and she had lunch with them here the news is not important but still i took this article because konda reddy tribes are important from prelims perspective that is why we are going to see few facts about them see konda reddy tribe is one of the ancient tribes in india they are one of the most backward tribal groups in the states of andhra pradesh and telangana they are living on the hilly terrains of bison hills which spread in east and west godavari districts of andhra pradesh along the banks of river godavari now coming to the language they speak they speak telugu with outsiders now this tribe resides near the hill and river settlements as i just said so their main occupation is agriculture they mainly cultivate tobacco and other grains they also cultivate the crops in a distinct way called podu so podu cultivation is nothing but the another name of slash and burn agriculture or the jhum cultivation i note that at present the population of this tribe is only in hundreds and their livelihood is mainly dependent on other forest products like honey gathering the medicinal plants leaves roots etc in this manner they follow a very ancient pattern of life now these tribal people worship gods of nature and every family has their family god or goddesses now they also celebrate many festivals like mavidi panduga gongra panduga pacha panduga etc now another fact from prelims that you need to know is that this tribal group of konda reddy has been designated the status of particularly vulnerable tribal group from the states of andhra pradesh and telangana so these are the facts that you need to know about konda reddy tribes now let's get to the next discussion so now let us take up this last news article for today it is the text and context article which is with reference to the election of president of india see the tenure of current president is going to end so the 16th presidential election will be held to elect his successor soon so in this context only this article talks about the election of indian president and the value of vote of an member of parliament and the member of legislative assembly See, actually, the value of vote concept is quite important from UPSC perspective because already in the year 2018 we had a question on this topic. I'll be discussing this question at the practice questions session. 
So now let us get to the discussion. Before that, the syllabus relevant to this discussion is highlighted here for your reference. Now we know that the president of India is elected not directly by the people. Then how she or he is elected? Actually, Article 54 of Indian Constitution deals with the election of the president, and Article 55 stipulates the manner in which the election of president should be held. According to these two articles, President of India is elected by the members of Electoral College. So, who are all the members of Electoral College? It consists of the elected members of both houses of the parliament, that is the elected members of Lok Sabha as well as Rajya Sabha. Then it includes the elected members of legislative assemblies of the state. Then third, it also includes the elected members of legislative assemblies of Union Territories of Delhi and Puducherry. Okay. Here you should note that the newly formed Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir as of now does not form part of this electoral college but previously when it was a full-fledged state it was part of the electoral college. Now these are the members of electoral college that elects the president of India but who are all not the members? Note that the nominated members of both houses of the parliament are not the members. Then the nominated members of the state legislative assemblies are not the members. Then the elected as well as nominated members of state legislative councils are not the members of electoral college. And then the nominated members of legislative assemblies of Delhi and Puducherry do not participate in the election of president. So mostly the nominated members are not part of the election of president. So why this kind of system is stipulated by the constitution? It is because constitution ensures that there is a uniformity in the scale of representation of different states. Along with that, it also wants parity between the states as a whole and the union, particularly in the election of the president. Now comes the vote. See, the vote cast by each member of parliament or member of legislative assembly is not calculated as one vote. Rather, there is a larger vote value attached to each of those votes. We'll see how. See, the value of vote of an MLA is calculated by dividing the total population of the state by the total number of elected members in the state legislative assembly. Here is the formula. Here you can see that the quotient which is achieved by this division is further divided by 1000. Let us take an example here. Let us take Andhra Pradesh. According to the 1971 census, the total population of Andhra Pradesh was 2.7 crores. And the total number of uh, elective seats in the state assembly is 175. So according to this formula, 2.7 crores divided by 175 and then it is further divided by 1000. And here the answer will be 159. So that means the total value of vote of each MLA from Andhra Pradesh is 159. And if you want the total value of votes of uh, total Andhra Pradesh, then you have to multiply 159 into 175, which is value of vote of each member into the total number of seats. And similarly, if we calculate for Uttar Pradesh, it is 208. And note that this is the highest vote value. So Uttar Pradesh has the highest vote value for each of its MLAs. And similarly, Arunachal Pradesh has just 8. So the vote value of each MLA differs from state to state and it is based on the calculation that factors in its population and the number of members in its legislative assembly. So vote value of each MLA is dependent on the population and then the number of members in legislative assembly. Now here still the 1971 census data is taken for population. It is because the 42nd Amendment Act of 1976 frozen the total number of seats in assembly of each state till the year 2000. And this was further extended up to 2026 by the 84th Amendment Act of 2001. So till 2026 only the 1971 census will be taken for this calculation. So this was for the MLAs. Now what about for MPs? Here, the value of the vote of an MP is calculated by simply dividing the total value of votes of all the MLAs of all the states by the total number of elected members of parliament. Now, here you should note that total value of votes of all MLAs of all states is 549495. And the total number of uh, elected members of parliament would be the total members of uh, Lok Sabha plus Rajya Sabha, which is 543 plus 233. It comes at 776. So, the total number of votes of all Rajya Sabha and Lok Sabha MPs would be 776 into 708, which is 549408. So, this was for the MPs. Now, the total value of votes of MLAs we saw and then for MPs we saw. 
so overall the total value of votes of the electors for the presidential election will be the value that we calculated for mlas plus the value for mps which comes at 10098903 but why we calculate the value of votes now to understand that first we need to know what happens in the election process see the presidential election is held in accordance with the system of proportional representation by means of single transferable vote and here the voting is held by secret ballot so this system ensures that the successful candidate is returned by the absolute majority of votes so therefore if a candidate is to be declared as elected to the office of president then that candidate should secure a fixed quota of votes which is 50% of the total votes cast plus 1 and the 50% is calculated by the total number of valid votes divided by 2 plus 1 Now here the total votes cast is nothing but the total value of votes which we calculated okay don't get confused here now here the total value of votes that will be considered is the one that is obtained from the valid votes in the first round of election see actually each member of the electoral college is given only one ballot paper and here the voter will be asked to cast his or her vote in a preferential order that is they have to mention uh, the first preference then the second preference third preference and fourth preference like that now what happens in the first round or the first phase is the first preference votes are counted so assume that i am an mla from andhra pradesh we saw that the value of vote of each mla is 159 in andhra pradesh so that means my vote has the value of 159 so if i give my vote to candidate a the candidate a will get 159 now along with me 10 other mlas also vote for that same candidate a that means the value of vote will be 159 into 10 it will be 1590 in total so like that for each state there is different value of votes and based on that the total value will differ so when the first round happens in that first round the first preference will be taken and based on that first preference if assume that the total value arrived at is 89000 so the target that will be set will be 89000 divided by 2 plus 1 so this is the target that should be achieved by the presidential candidate to be declared as elected to the office of president now in the first phase if any candidate gets this target then that candidate is declared elected otherwise the process of transfer of votes is set in motion here what will happen is the ballots of the candidate who secured the least number of first preference votes are cancelled and his or her second preference votes are transferred to the first preference votes of other candidates and this process continues till the candidate secures the required quota so this is how the presidential election happens and the president is elected and this is where the value of votes of each MPs and MLAs matter. So I hope you're clear about this concept because it is important for prelims. So with these facts in mind, now let us get to the last session of the day, which is the practice questions discussion session. So I'm going to start the questions discussion with this previous year question. It appeared in 2020. This question is about the district central cooperative banks. Let us take the first statement. In terms of short term credit delivery to the agriculture sector DCCBs deliver more credit in comparison to the scheduled commercial banks and regional rural banks so this statement is incorrect even though the focus of rural cooperative lending is agriculture still the share in credit flow to agriculture by the rural cooperatives is less according to certain data it is only 12.1% as compared to 76% of scbs and 11.9% of rrbs that is regional rural banks so when we compare them with scbs it is quite less and that is why the statement is incorrect now the second statement one of the most important functions of dccbs is to provide funds to the primary agricultural credit societies now this statement is correct We know that DCCBs are at the intermediate level and PSEs are at the grassroots level. And one of the significant roles of DCCB is to support and develop the primary agricultural credit societies, and in that way, it provides funds to the PSEs. Here, DCCBs mobilize deposits from the public and provide credit to the PSEs. So this statement is correct. Now, here the question asks for the correct statements, and that is why the correct answer is option B, two only. Now, let us take the practice question based on PSEs. It is a three statement question. First statement is it provides loans but cannot accept deposits. This statement is incorrect. See, PSEs provides loans but only to its members, but it also accepts deposits. 
so statement one is incorrect the moment you know that you can eliminate option a and b now the second statement it is regulated by rbi so during discussion itself i said that pscs are outside the purview of banking regulation act right and therefore they are not regulated by rbi so statement 2 is incorrect actually even if you don't know whether statement 1 or 3 are correct or incorrect you can arrive at the correct answer if you know that statement 2 is incorrect why because if you can eliminate statement 2 you can easily arrive at the correct answer which is option c 3 only so what is statement 3 it only provides medium and short term loans this is correct why because pscs does not provide long term loans remember this fact so this is how you use certain crucial facts for using the elimination technique. Now the next question is based on the three cities of world program. First statement is the program was launched at the first world forum on urban forest held in Italy. This statement is correct. It was held in the year 2018. It was launched by the FAO and the Arbor Day Foundation. So first statement is correct. Now the second statement. Hyderabad is the only city in India to be recognized under the program. Now this statement is incorrect. Why? Because in the discussion itself we saw that this year Mumbai has also joined this pride. Last year Hyderabad was the only city in India that was recognized. But this year along with Hyderabad Mumbai is also recognized. So this statement is incorrect. Now here while marking the correct answer be careful because the question asks for the incorrect statements. So correct answer is option B 2 only. Now let us take up this 2018 question. It is regarding the election of President of India. Now this is the question I was talking about that is regarding the value of vote. The first statement is the value of the vote of each MLA varies from state to state. This statement is correct. During discussion itself I particularly noted that it varies. Why it varies? Because the votes are based on the population of the state and the number of seats in the legislative assembly. The population and the seats vary state to state. That is why the value also varies. So first statement is right. Second statement. The value of the vote of MPs of the Lok Sabha is more than the value of the vote of MPs of the Raji Sabha. Now this statement is incorrect. Why? Because it is same. And that is why the statement of you know one is more than the other becomes invalid here. Here the value is calculated after calculating the total members of the parliament. That is why here the value remains the same. Now here the question asks for the correct statements. So the correct answer is option A, one only. Now let us take up this question. It is on combined maritime forces. First statement, it is a multinational naval partnership which exists to uphold the rules based international order. This is correct. We saw this during discussion itself. Second statement, India is a member of the combined maritime forces. See this statement is incorrect because even now India has decided only to join CMF that too as only associate partner and not as a member. So statement 2 is incorrect and here the question asks for the correct statement. So correct answer is option A, one only. So with these prelims questions, I'm going to take the quiz questions. Today I have two quiz questions. Both these questions are based on the discussions on different news articles. If you have listened to it carefully, you can easily attend this question. And even if you are unable to arrive at the correct answer, go back to the discussion, listen to it again and then try to answer these questions. You can post the answer in the comment section and I will tell you whether your answer is right or not. So with these prelims questions, I'm going to take one main question. Interested aspirants can write answer to this question. So with this, we have come to the end of today's Hindu News Analysis. If you like this video, don't forget to like, comment and share. And also subscribe to Shankar Ice Academy YouTube channel for more updates related to civil services preparation. Thank you.